Okay, let's talk Colts. To me, the Colts are a team that massively underperformed in 2022 relative to their potential. And some of that's due to injuries and some of that's due to, you know, some position groups not performing as well as maybe we hoped. And some of that is due to their over-reliance on very old quarterbacks. Was all of it Frank Reich's fault? No. Was all of it Matt Ryan's fault? Also no. Was all of it the offensive line's fault? Kind of, but not entirely. Suffice to say that there was just a lot going on in Indy and almost none of it worked and we're kind of looking for an entire reset here. So that's what this offseason is all about. This is a mock full offseason for the Indianapolis Colts picking at the fourth overall spot. We're going to be going through salary cap management, you know, potential trades, a mock free agency period, a mock draft uh, based on, you know, potential trade scenarios, which we'll go over in a little bit. This is me trying to reboot the franchise in one offseason to hopefully live up closer to the expectations I had for them last year. So without further ado, I'm not going to waste any more of your time. Let's get to the first section, which is salary cap management, trades, and free agency. First things first, let's get a top-down view of the resources that we have to work with here. The Colts have 12.2 million available right now as of the time of me recording this, and that's simply not enough because we're going to have to allocate a significant chunk of that for rookies, plus we have a whole bunch of guys that we have to extend as well to try to preserve our homegrown core. So in order to generate a lot more money, first thing we're going to do is obviously cut Matt Ryan. We're going to take a big dead cap hit because of that, but we're also going to save $17.2 million in the process. We're also going to restructure DeForest Buckner, who has about $18.75 million tied up in his base salary right now, and we're going to convert that to a bonus so that we can spread that cap hit out and save yet another $9.3 million with that restructure. We can also save $2.1 million by cutting Nick Foles. We can restructure Ryan Kelly to save another $4.5 million, and he's still easily cuttable next year if we need to, but I don't anticipate that we will. Either way, that frees up more space this year. And all of those initial moves added up get us to about $45.3 million in cap space. Just as a side note, I'm not doing these moves, but we could potentially also save $8.2 million by cutting Kenny Moore, who's kind of underperformed on his contract. And if we really wanted to, we could save $9.9 million by cutting Stephon Gilmore, but I'm going to keep both of those guys on the roster for now because I don't want to create too many holes to fill in one offseason. So again, just with all of the actual moves that I'm doing, we're going to get $45.3 million in space minus the $7.5 million that we're going to have to allocate for this rookie class. So in total, in terms of space that we can allocate for extending our own homegrown talent or signing outside free agents, we are left with a whopping total of $37.8 million. Hopefully all of that made sense, but if it didn't, again, please let me know in the comments. I will try to explain it as best that I can, but we're going to move on pretty quickly here. We still have a lot of guys to sign. Unfortunately, we can't retain everybody on the roster, though, because that would just be simply too expensive and slightly unnecessary. So I do want to make a note here that we are going to let Bobby Okereke walk in free agency. He's simply going to command too much money here, and we have other young linebackers that we can still extend that I think can play his role pretty damn well. If there's one thing the Colts are good at, it's drafting and developing linebackers, so we don't necessarily have to pay Okereke top dollar, and we're going to go let him get you know some crazy deal in free agency and hopefully get a pretty decent comp pick back in return. Now, as for who we actually are extending slash signing, I am going to be bringing in Mike White to be the new veteran type backup to go along with Sam Ellinger. That's going to be a two-year, $11 million deal in total with $6 million guaranteed. That will be a $5.5 million cap hit for 2023, if my math is correct, and that's going to leave us with $32.3 million left over. I don't know if this was obvious enough, but I just want to verbalize it here. I don't plan on starting Mike White. I do plan on going after a rookie here that ideally will be our day one starter. But in the absence of Matt Ryan and Nick Foles, I still think that we do need an older veteran quarterback to kind of be in the room and help guide the young guys, especially the one that we plan on drafting here, which we'll get to in a little bit. But if that young guy does happen to get injured, knock on wood, I do think that Mike White could step in there and start for a few games and we would probably survive. So overall, I think that's a pretty prudent signing here. 
and I'm going to take the remaining 32.3 million that we have after that deal and use all of that entirely to try to keep our homegrown talent together. First up is going to be Michael Pittman Jr. I really want to get this deal done before the next wave of receivers get signed. You know, the Justin Jeffersons and Jamar Chases of the world. I would love to lock this in now. And even though Michael Pittman is not like a top end elite wide receiver one, he's still a very solid weapon. You can put him as like a lower end wide receiver one, high end wide receiver two. Either way, he's worth an extension to me, and he's one of the more reliable weapons on the team when he's healthy. Based on the current scale of receiver salaries, I think it's likely he's going to get something similar to the Chris Godwin deal down in Tampa Bay, which is three years, $60 million total, 35 in guarantees, so it's a little bit less in guarantees than Godwin got. We're also going to do a $20 million signing bonus and tack on two void years at the end to spread out that cap hit a little bit more because, again, we're going to have a young quarterback with a fifth year option and the franchise tag available. So there's like six years of contract control there. I'm not really worried about that cap hit blowing up a little bit later with all the void year stuff we're going to be fine. The cap hit specifically for 2023 will only be about 4.8 million. And again, that will balloon later, but we'll be okay. And to be honest, I'm kind of half assuming that we're going to tear this deal up in about three years and work out another extension anyway, because I do genuinely think that Michael Pittman is a good player. But even if we don't figure out a second extension, the void year is still probably only going to hit for like 7 million in dead cap anyway. So it's not that big of a deal. That's just my way of securing a good receiver at about 66% of the cost of the top end wide receiver one market right now. And it's not going to hurt us too badly on the cap by spreading out that signing bonus. This deal in total is going to bring us down to 27.5 million still remaining in our 2023 salary cap. And we're going to use part of that money to once again extend Yannick and Gakwe. It feels like one of the only constants in the universe is that Yannick will play for Gus Bradley wherever Gus Bradley happens to be coaching. And at least as of the time of me recording this, it seems like Gus is going to be retained as the defensive coordinator in Indy. So to me, naturally, it makes sense that Yannick is going to be back with the Colts. He is one of the more consistent edge rushers in the entire league over the last seven years. It feels like you can pretty much bank on him getting like eight to ten sacks minimum per year. So he is still pretty consistently productive, and I don't think he's going to break the bank either. This is going to be a two-year deal for another $28 million in total, so $14 million per year. Half of that is going to be guaranteed, just like his last contract, and there's going to be an $8 million signing bonus. In terms of how we're spreading out the cap hit on this deal, we're going to have a $6 million guaranteed salary for 2023, plus obviously half that signing bonus. So we're looking at a $10 million cap hit for this season and $18 million next year, but only $4 million of that is guaranteed. So it's still a pretty team-friendly deal if we need to cut him. Not that I'm advocating for that because, again, he's still a pretty productive player, but if we absolutely need to, it is a pretty cuttable deal after one year. Yannick is getting a pretty significant chunk of money up front, so he's happy. We get a good player. It just works for everybody. After this deal is done, which again is going to be a $10 million cap hit, we are left with $17.5 million still remaining, and I have three more Colts that I want to extend. First up is going to be Paris Campbell, who's coming off of his best year as a Colt. I'm still not entirely sure if I want to commit long term, though, because again, him actually being on the field has been a little bit of an issue throughout his career. So to me, what I think is fair for both sides is kind of like the same prove it deal that Juju Smith-Schuster got in Kansas City for one year. If he performs well, obviously he'll be able to make even more money going into 2024, either with Indy or with somebody else. And if he doesn't prove it, then, you know, no skin off our nose. It's just a one year deal and we can move on and, and that's that. But in terms of the actual money here, again, we're just giving him the same deal that Juju Smith-Schuster got. So it's one year, $4 million deal, two and a half guaranteed. The cap hit is going to be $4 million, and that leaves us with $13.5 million still available. I really am rooting for Paris Campbell. I hope that he kind of builds off of his 2022 and has an excellent 2023. And if he does have an excellent 2023, he's going to be making a hell of a lot more than this in 2024. So genuinely, hopefully he does outperform this deal. With the 13 and a half million that we still have left over, my highest remaining priority is to extend Chase McLaughlin. 
who for the first time in a long time gave the Colts some stability at kicker. It had been a few years since they you know, really had that and he was excellent last year. My template for this deal is the one that Young Way Koo got down in Atlanta, who also is a really excellent, consistent kicker. But I think that Chase McLaughlin uh, has not quite proven it to the level that Koo has, so it's a little bit less money, but we're talking barely. It's still a pretty decent kicker contract in the top 10 in the market, and I think the Colts uh, should be willing to pay that because what other option do they have right so this is going to be a five-year extension at 20 million dollars total which again less than young way Koo, but still pretty significant kicker money only 8 million in guarantees 6.25 million guaranteed at signing with the first year salary guaranteed as well so these are the same guarantees that Koo got from atlanta but the top end of the deal again is a little bit less the structure of this deal is gonna spread out the cap hit quite a lot. So the first year cap hit is only 3 million and the most it will ever balloon up to is like four and a half million. So it's not a bad deal at all. And it's technically only a two year deal if they really want it to be, they can get out of it pretty easily after 2024. So it's a pretty team friendly deal, even though it is technically top of market for the kicker market. But I think having a consistent kicker is absolutely worth the money. And again, it's not that much in the grand scheme of things. So this is going to leave us with 10 and a half million remaining, which is still a pretty healthy amount of space. And that is just enough to allow us to extend one of my favorite and most underrated Colts on this defense. And that's EJ Speed. Speed primarily played outside linebacker for the Colts this year. He was their third linebacker, typically in their 4-3 base package. He was at the same spot, but in some certain nickel packages, I would see him at Mike. They had some 3-3-5 looks they would run with Okereke and Zaire Franklin and him all in the field at the same time. Those were, you know, kind of very specific packages, but the most common package he was in, he was a Sam linebacker in a 4-3 look, and he was really damn good at it. He's long, he stacks and sheds well at the point of attack, so he plays the run really well. He's way more fluid in coverage than I think he gets credit for. Not that he gets any credit in the national media anyway, but I just think he's a very solid all-around linebacker that could play multiple spots in pretty much any system. And that's the type of linebacker that, you know, if you find them later in the draft and you develop them and and they end up being like your third or fourth guy that could still give you you know quality starter play if somebody goes down that is absolutely a valuable piece to keep and so i'm going to be prioritizing him again we're giving him the same deal that zaire franklin got this time last year he used to be the third linebacker on this team now he's the second linebacker so ej speed now that he's the third linebacker we're just gonna duplicate that deal, which is three years, $10 million in total, 4 million in guarantees. The cap hit's gonna be three and a half million, and that's gonna leave us with 7 million left over. Again, this is a really good value deal for a really high quality player that doesn't get pretty much any publicity outside of Indianapolis. Like he's just not recognized for what he is in the national media, which is a very quality linebacker that a lot of teams would love to have. And I think the Colts, you know, they're going to make the most of it and sign their homegrown talent and have once again, one of, if not the best linebacker core in the entire NFL. He's a great player. Love that kid. Hopefully Indy keeps him around. Like I mentioned, we are left over with 7 million after this whole uh, free agency spending spree, at least mini spending spree. And I'm gonna be standing on that 7 million and saving as much as I can for incidentals. So again, I'm gonna rest on that 7 million. We did a lot of good work with it here today, but we still have the NFL draft to get to. And I know that is primarily what people watch this series for is seeing who I'm gonna draft for all these individual teams. And I'll tell you what, we have a doozy of a mock draft for the Colts. But before I get to it, I do want to thank our sponsor for helping to make this episode possible in the first place, and that is Factor. Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. All Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat in just two minutes, which is perfect for very busy weeks like this one because it's combine week by the time this comes out, which is always a whirlwind for everybody in football media. 
and none of us have any time to do anything, especially cook. So Factor's great for times like this one. Their menus are updated weekly and include 34 plus meal options and 36 plus add-on options, like a whole bunch of different snacks and sweets and stuff like that. You can choose your favorite meals or let Factor craft your order based on your taste preferences and meal history. At least for me, I was a big fan in the last box of the pork ragu cavatappi, as well as the shredded chicken taco bowl, which was really, really good, and the stuffed pepper casserole, which is always solid. And that was only like half the box, but all of those things really stood out to me. So highly recommend you get those if you get your own box as well. Plus the smoothies that come with our package are really good too. They're plant-based and only like 120 calories, so they're a pretty filling midday snack. So overall, if you're looking for quick food options to get you through a busy day, I think Factor is definitely worth giving a try just to see if you like it too. And if you do want to try it out, you can use my promo code by heading to factor75.com or click the link down below and use promo code FILMROOM50 and that will give you 50% off your first Factor box. Again, that is factor75.com or click the link down below and use promo code FILMROOM50 to get 50% off your first order. Thank you once again to Factor for sponsoring today's show. And with that, let's get to this mock draft. I know that Anthony Richardson is probably not the quarterback that you expected here. I know that most people are linking the Colts to Bryce Young and CJ Stroud and to a slightly lesser degree, Will Levis. And Anthony Richardson is not getting talked about as much to Indy. But I do want to explain myself here. I really wanted to approach the fourth overall pick under the scenario that the Colts are not able to trade up to first overall. You know, to me, I wanted to have a thought exercise of, okay, if they can't get up to number one to get Bryce Young, what are they going to do? What is plan B or plan C? Because you still have to have a plan, right? There's multiple teams that are vying for the number one pick. If they get outbid, what are the Colts going to do? And to me, the best option, if they're just left at number four, is to go with Anthony Richardson. I know that Will Levis has a lot of fans, and to be honest, I'm a fan of Will Levis as well. But if I have to go down swinging here and I have to bet my job as a general manager on one of these quarterback talents, I'm going to bet it on Anthony Richardson. To me, I think he's more accurate than Levis. He's more mobile than Levis. His arm is better than Levis. And, you know, looking at Levis on tape, like some of his interceptions were just really wild. You know, some of the touch throws that he was asked to make, I mean, there just really wasn't any touch at all. He's really good at the drive throws, but in terms of, you know, layering the ball over a sinking corner or, you know, trying to throw it with any sort of arc to hit the outside shoulder on a go ball, I just don't quite think that Levis is there yet, and I think that Anthony Richardson is better at those types of throws than Will Levis is. Not to mention, I think that Richardson has better pocket presence as well. I think he senses pressure better. I think he gets out of pressure better. I just think that there's a lot of things that Anthony Richardson does that he does better than Levis. And I also think that just looking at the history of Shane Steichen as a coach, I think that Anthony Richardson fits Steichen better as well. Going back to his time working with Justin Herbert and then obviously with Jalen Hurts, I think one of the things that Steichen truly believes in as an offensive coach is simplifying things for a young quarterback through aggression. And what I mean by that is that Steichen's passing game philosophy can be boiled down to everything becomes a one-on-one -on -one eventually when you're down the field. It doesn't matter if it's man coverage or if it's cover three or if it's quarters or quarter, quarter, half, even to a degree cover two, you know, depending on the pass concept. Once you're 20 plus yards down the field, it's all one-on-one. -on -one. And at that point, it just becomes a game of matchups, right? And it becomes, you know, how are you reading the leverage down the field based on the coverage? But very rarely are you going to see a true double team. The only true like actual double team type coverages you're going to see in the NFL are certain types of match quarters where there's kind of like an inside out bracket on the X backside and three by one or, you know, cover one double jersey number, which is like just a version of cover one. But there's not a whole lot of actual double teams in the NFL. Typically, NFL defensive coordinators are just trusting their guys to go survive on these one-on-one -on -one matchups deep down the field. And so, to me, I think Steichen exploits that by stressing defenses vertically and saying, okay, if you're going to play it one-on-one, -on -one, whether you're in quarters or whether you're in cover three or whether you're in actual cover one, we're going to test that. And we're going to let our quarterback make throws deep down the field. 
And if you break it up, fine. But we're not going to make it easy on you. We're going to make you do your job as a DB and go survive against these 35, 40, 45 yard bombs down the field. And if we win, we get chunks. And if we get chunks, we score a shitload of points. If you look at Steichen's work in LA with Herbert and you look at his work with Jalen Hurts in Philly, that is literally what the passing game boiled down to. It's we are going to create one on one matchups 20 plus yards down the field and trust our quarterback to make the throw. And to me, in this class, if I am giving a quarterback to that type of coach that really wants to go deep, Anthony Richardson is the guy. I'm not saying that he is a flawless prospect because obviously he's not. There's some post-snap processing stuff that gets him into trouble from time to time. There were some pretty wonky interceptions where it just kind of felt like he was not really on the same page as his receivers. And I'm not in the quarterback room, so I can't really you know tell you why that happened, but it happened. Again, there's some pretty ugly tape you know out there from time to time, but to me, it's not as much as Will Levis. And I think that the highs are higher and the lows are not as frequent. And so if I'm just trusting one of these rookie quarterbacks to step into Indy and be the guy, I think Richardson is it. He's a really, really talented prospect. And in an AFC that is continuously getting stacked with super weapons at quarterback, you're kind of fucked if you don't have one yourself. So you might as well draft the guy that you think has the best chance of being a super weapon. And I think that's what we did here. Hopefully that properly explained my thought process here. Again, if you have any questions or you want me to expand on anything about these quarterbacks, feel free to ask down in the comments below. But for now, we're going to move on to round two in this Colts specific mock draft because we have another position that arguably did even more damage to this team than quarterback last year, and we cannot go any longer without fixing it. And surprisingly, that is guard. Contrary to popular belief, I actually don't think the Colts offensive line is that bad. They just really struggled with injuries last year in the first half of the season that kind of caused a little bit of a carousel at certain positions. Obviously, it took a little longer than we had hoped for Bernhard Ryman to settle in at left tackle, but eventually he did. And looking at the rest of the offensive line, again, you got Quentin Nelson, who when he's at the top of his game and healthy, he's one of the best guards in the league. Ryan Kelly as well, when he's healthy, is a pretty solid center. Braden Smith is a top 10, you know, actually not even top 10, top five to six right tackle in the league. You know, when he's at the top of his game, they all didn't have their best 2022, but just kind of going off of past years, they should be a lot better in 2023 if we're talking about them, you know, regressing to the mean. Really, the one spot that was an absolute disaster last year was right guard, which I think made the entire offensive line look worse than it really was. The Colts right guard spot was probably like the single worst, ugliest turnstile in the entire NFL in 2022. And when you have a quarterback like Matt Ryan, who quite frankly can't move at all, Again, the pressure numbers really added up just because of those two things. But looking forward to 2023, if we're putting Steve Avila from TCU at that right guard spot, I think this is actually a pretty good offensive line on paper. Looking at Avila in particular, obviously he did play left guard at TCU, so we are asking him to switch sides. And that could be a little wonky at first, but just from a pure talent perspective, I mean, he's got great feet, like an explosive first step. A first step that you're not used to seeing from a guard. He's really strong. He's super thick. He's like 330, 340, but you wouldn't know it based on his foot speed. He's really, really athletic. I love his hand placement. You know, in terms of run blocking, they pretty much only ran inside zone at TCU, so we didn't get to see a whole huge variety of runs out of him, at least not as much as some of the other guards in this class, but just from a pass protection standpoint, I don't think there's any guard in this class that is as good in pass protection as Steve Avila. And I don't even really think it's particularly close. He is rock solid and something that the Colts desperately need, especially if they have a young quarterback who's gonna be trying to figure it out on the fly. But if he can make that transition to right guard, which I think he can, we're looking at a starting five of Ryman, Nelson, Kelly, Avila, and Braden Smith at right tackle. And just pure speculation on paper, that is a top 10 offensive line in the league. I know health is a factor. I know that, you know, young guys acclimating to the NFL is a factor, but 
I mean, damn, there's a lot of teams that would kill to have that group. And I think that the Colts offensive line going from one of the worst in the league, at least in terms of pressures given up, to one of the best in the league is absolutely on the table. But in order to do that, again, I think they need to take Steve Avila. Really good player. Hopefully he's there at pick 35. I wouldn't be surprised if he's gone in the first round. But if he is there, he should be a Colt. From here, we're going to move down to round three, pick 79. And we're going to throw a pick finally at the defense. Tyreek Stevenson really fits what the Colts like at corner. He's bigger, he's longer, he's got 84th percentile length, he's six foot plus. And even though he's not the fastest guy, you know, maybe he's going to hit high 4-4, but I really doubt that he's going to hit low 4-4. He might be like a 4-5 flat type of guy, which is why he's going to go this late in the first place. You know, on tape, his recovery speed is just okay. And I think that is a weakness of his that when somebody gets behind him, I don't really think he can catch up. But that being said, it's really freaking hard to get behind him because he is so physical at the line of scrimmage. He uses his length well. He's got great technique. He's got great hips, great feet, all that kind of stuff. So even though he's not a burner, he's such a physical technician that he's tough to beat anyway. Plus, when the ball's in the air, I mean, outside of Christian Gonzalez and Devin Witherspoon at the very top of the draft, I don't think there's any corner in this class that plays the ball at the catch point better than Tyreek Stevenson. He is so aggressive. He never gives up. He's really good at using that length to kind of get in there and disrupt the receiver's hands. He's just remarkably effective at the point of the catch. And again, it just makes him really hard to beat. So if he's on top of you and he's playing chest to chest and he's playing like, you know, standard top down press technique, you're probably not going to catch the ball. Pretty much the only thing he can't do is if somebody gets a free release and you're asking him to turn and burn. That's not something I'm going to make him do, but I don't necessarily think Gus Bradley would make him do it anyway. I think he's a great fit for what they like at corner. And in terms of the DBs that are going to be available at pick 79, Tyreek Stevenson to me is the best of the bunch. He's a really solid player and a great overall fit in Indianapolis. From here, we're going to move down to round four, pick 106. And we're going to go back to building around our young quarterback and give Anthony Richardson yet another young weapon. I talked earlier about Shane Steichen emphasizing a vertical passing game in order to kind of simplify things through regression. And very few receivers in this class, I think, fit that type of offense better than Jaden Reed from Michigan State. He has legit 4-4, maybe even 4-3 speed. Again, I'm recording this way before the combine, so we actually haven't seen him run yet. But just going off of GPS data and going off of tape, I mean, this dude is an actual speed demon. He kind of reminds me of T.Y. Hilton a little bit, which I know is a super lofty comparison. But in terms of smaller, fast guy with contested catch ability, like he's actually a really solid contested catcher, especially deep down the field, which T.Y. obviously was as well. I just think that he kind of profiles as a very similar receiver. And as your fourth guy, you know, behind Michael Pittman and Alec Pierce and Paris Campbell, you can throw him in there in certain 11 personnel looks when you really want to stretch the field. And I think he would do it better than any of the guys they already have on the roster. He's a better vertical threat than Paris Campbell. He's a better vertical threat than Michael Pittman. Alec Pierce is a vertical threat himself, but I think in a different sort of style, I think he wins more with, you know, leverage and body control and all that kind of stuff. Whereas Jaden Reed will just straight up run by you. But again, he brings a different skill set to this Colts receiving core that I don't think they quite have yet. And one that I think they will be trying to prioritize with Steichen and Anthony Richardson. If we are going to make the most use out of Richardson's arm, we need guys who can actually stretch the field deep. Jaden Reed fits that bill. Very underrated receiver in this class and somebody who I think is a lock for the top 100-ish picks. This is pick 106, so it's slightly outside the top 100, but not by much. I think that you're going to hear his name called somewhere late day two, 
early day three at the absolute latest. He's one of my favorite receivers in this class, one of the most exciting skill position players in this class, and somebody that all of you, regardless of the team you support, should be paying attention to. He's a really, really explosive player. With that, we're gonna go down to the fifth round, pick 140 overall, and we're gonna spend another pick trying to fortify this secondary. Full disclosure, I have no idea if JL Skinner is even gonna be available at this pick. Under normal circumstances, he would probably be a late day two, early day three type of guy, somewhere in the back half of the third round, early part of the fourth round. And you might be wondering, okay, then why is he available in the fifth here? Unfortunately, he's coming off a pretty major injury. He literally just tore his pectoral while training for the combine. And that's a pretty nasty injury. Anybody who's ever torn their pet can tell you about it. It hurts a lot and it takes a while to recover from. So he's probably not gonna get a rookie offseason. He might start on the pup list. Again, it depends on how bad the tear was, but I think generally speaking, it's pretty safe to assume that he's not gonna be able to do any sort of you know pre-draft workouts. He's not gonna do rookie minicamp. He probably won't do OTAs. You know, maybe he won't even do training camp. So it's tough to know. Obviously, I'm not a doctor and I'm not doing any sort of medical evaluation on him, but a rookie safety losing their rookie offseason is a pretty big deal. And I do think that he will slip in the draft a little bit because of that, which is unfortunate because he's legitimately a really good player. He's 6'4", he's long, he's got speed, he has better feet and hip fluidity than he has any right to have at his size. Like he's legitimately gifted athletically. And I think his type of role that you project for him as your big DB that you line up against tight ends in like a three safety nickel package and say, go take away that tight end. Like that is an actual valuable role to have. And I think that he would fill it brilliantly it's just the injury that I think will suppress his value. It's really unfortunate for him, and I do hope that in the actual draft, it doesn't affect his value because I want him to make as much money as possible, but we're just being realistic here. And I think that he is somebody that should be talked about by a lot of different fan bases because I don't really see him getting any sort of publicity or attention. He's a very solid safety, somebody that should be on your radar, especially if you're the Colts, who, in my opinion, are in pretty big need of a third safety to fill that type of role. So again, we'll see where he goes in the real draft. It could be anywhere from the third round to, I guess, the fifth round. Hopefully he goes higher than this. Wish him the best in his recovery. And with that, let's get to our second fifth round pick, pick 164, and we're gonna stay with the defense here. With Bobby Okereke moving on in this mock offseason and EJ Speed being, I guess you could say, promoted from the fourth linebacker to the third linebacker, I'm gonna be drafting another fourth linebacker here to just kind of keep that pipeline going. And there is nobody in this class that I think fits that type of mold better than Yasir Abdullah. As a likely day three pick, I know this comp is going to sound absolutely insane, but he really does remind me a lot of Kyle Van Noy. You know, kind of a do-it-all linebacker that can rush off the edge and he can cover well. Uh, you know, he can play all the off-ball spots and do all the, the stacking and shedding, all the linebackery things, uh, to, to use our favorite terminology. He can do all that in addition to being a kick-ass pass rusher. Like, he got 65 pressures at Louisville last year. That is insane. And I know he's only like 6'1", 235, so he's not the biggest guy in the world, but his first step is great. His hips are phenomenal. You know, he's got every kind of pass rush move you can think of. In addition to also being able to do all the off-ball linebacker stuff and cover, Again, really, really valuable player, really versatile player. I think you plop him in with the Colts and you say, you are our backup Sam linebacker behind EJ Speed. And if we really want to put you on the field on third down, you can rush the passer for us. So he will get on the field in some capacity, whether it's at, you know, Sam linebacker, if he's unfortunately filling in for another injury, or if he's in certain like third down rush packages and he's lined up next to DeForest Buckner, he can do that too. He's just too versatile and too good of a player for me to not draft here. And considering the Colts history with taking later picks at linebacker and developing them into absolute studs, 
there's very few destinations that I want Yasir Abdullah to go to more than Indy because I think that would be great for his career and I think that eventually he'd make a shitload of money because he went to this franchise. Again, I want him to be as successful as humanly possible. This is the right situation for him. They would use him properly. They would develop him properly and they would make him look far better than a day three pick. Just a quick reminder, by the way, we do have an interview with Abdullah coming out over on our podcast channel, the Bootleg Football Podcast. He sat down with us for a little while and talked about, you know, his pass rush moves and, you know, how he made this incredible pick down the sideline where he literally arm barred a receiver and then picked it off. Stuff that you just don't expect edge rushers to do. He was a great guy to talk to. Uh, that interview should be coming out uh, hopefully pretty soon within the next couple weeks. So go subscribe to our podcast channel for that. We also have other interviews live with Zay Flowers, who's going to be, you know, picked somewhere in the first round. By the time this comes out, our first 10 gems episode on defense will be out. We did kind of a draft primer. So if you want more draft talk, go over to the podcast channel, subscribe there, listen to that stuff. You're going to love it. But with all that being said, let's move on to our first seventh round pick all the way down at pick 223. And it's going to be yet another weapon on offense, but more importantly, a weapon on special teams. Nico Romijio from Fresno State is everything that you could want from like a typical day three slot receiver. Again, he's not the biggest guy in the world, but he's super quick. He's fast. He's got great hands. You know, he's really tough over the middle, an absolute warrior through contact. All of that stuff that you love about, you know, a, a dart throw on a day three slot, right? But what's even more impressive to me and the reason why I really want him here is because he is a fucking psychopath as a punt returner. If you want somebody who's going to break a million tackles like he's some kind of bite-sized Marshawn Lynch, Nico Remigio is your guy. He has some awe-inspiring punt return highlights. And even though he was only at Fresno State for one year, I mean, he was immediately the best returner in the Mountain West Conference, one of the best returners in the entire country. I think that he's going to get drafted just for that alone. And then on top of that, oh, by the way, you can throw him on the field as a slot receiver and you're gonna feel pretty good about that too. He is one of the most underrated offensive skill position players in this whole class because he also has that special teams versatility. And I think that he's gonna go later than he probably should, but whatever team gets him, you know, somewhere in the sixth or seventh round is gonna absolutely adore him. And he will make the team on special teams ability all by itself. I can pretty much guarantee you that. So Nico Romijo, Remember the name, he's going to get drafted somewhere on day three, and his future fan base is going to love him. From there, we're going to go 15 picks down the board to our last pick of this mock draft. It's our second seventh round pick, pick 238 overall. And once again, for the last time, we are bolstering the secondary. Starling Thomas V from UAB is another DB that I first got exposed to at the Shrine Bowl, and I instantly fell in love with his competitiveness, his aggression, his toughness. He's the type of guy that would line up and take three reps in a row in practice, back to back to back against all the best receivers, just because he wanted to put it on tape. He wanted to show what he could do. He was constantly leading drills. He was the first guy on the field. He was the last to leave. You know, his energy is infectious. He's a great locker room guy, and he's just so damn competitive. I think his future in the league is at nickel, even though he spent most of his time outside at UAB, and he legitimately did flash great cover skills at UAB. He's got good feet. He's explosive. You know, he's not the tallest guy in the world, and he's not necessarily the fastest guy in the world, at least on tape, but I, I wouldn't really qualify him as slow. I just think that with his build, you know, because he is kind of a stockier guy and his tackling ability and his aggressiveness and toughness, I do think that he is built more to survive in the slot than outside. Oh, and by the way, he also has some return versatility as well. So there's that too. 
I think in terms of spending a seventh round pick on somebody, I think somebody with special teams ability that can play all four core special teams, in addition to giving you some depth at nickel and maybe even some depth at safety too. Like I wouldn't rule that out either. I think that this is a pretty solid use of a late day three pick. And I think that Starling Thomas can contribute to this football team in multiple valuable ways. So once again, to kind of recap this entire mock draft here, pick four overall in the first round, we took Anthony Richardson, the quarterback out of Florida. Pick 35, we took Steve Avila, the guard from TCU. Pick 79, we took Tyreek Stevenson from Miami. Pick 106 was Jaden Reed from Michigan State. Pick 140 was JL Skinner from Boise State. Pick 164 was Yasir Abdullah from Louisville. Pick 223 was Nico Remigio, the return man from Fresno State. And pick 238, once again, Starling Thomas V, DB extraordinaire from UAB. Not to toot my own horn too much, but I do think this is a really good draft class and a great offseason overall. And I think that this group sets them up for success, not just going forward in the future, but I also think it sets them up for success in 2023 to hopefully have a pretty good bounce back season. All right, that'll do it for me today. Uh, if you're a Colts fan, I would love to get your thoughts down below, both good and bad on everything that I did. Maybe you have a wildly different perspective on how you would approach this off season, and I would love to hear about it. Uh, thank you once again to Underdog for providing this set and really everywhere that I've been shooting for the last, uh, I don't know, three days, I'm getting like two months worth of content here. So it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. So thank you to Underdog for that. I'm gonna get ready to record the Seahawks now. So later. <laughs>